is four o'clock in Arizona. So welcome to podcast number six or webinar. What, what, what should we call this? It's kind of a, a mix between a podcast and a webinar. So the cost of communication series, this is series number six. Thank you to Equa Marketing for being leaders in digital marketing and sponsoring this water cooler series. So this is series number six in what we're talking about tonight is patient retention. So we've been kind of going through what it costs and what that means by cost of communication with different versions in systems in the office. So we've talked about cost of communication when it comes to your vision, when it comes to setting expectations, your hygiene department, team retention, and tonight is on patient retention. Now here are a few objectives that we are going to look at. One is to discuss why patients leave. Last month we talked about why um, team members leave and today we're gonna to talk about why patients leave. Also we're going to talk about um, data. What is some relevant data that we should be looking at within our practice? And I know that's everybody's favorite thing to do, right? <laughs> Metrics and setting that up, not so much, but once we know what we're looking for, then it's a little easier to be able to have um, a way to manage the system. So what ends up happening, if we don't have awareness about it, then we're not really sure what's going on and we just make guesses as to what we think is happening. So once we understand where the data is coming from, then we can say, okay, well, let's take a deeper dive and say, what, why are patients leaving? So what's the data that we should be looking at to determine that? And then what's our role? What's our role as a dental professional in the practice to help in patient retention? Because each person is unique in what role they have. So why patients leave? And here's, here's just some examples of why they leave. It's not an exhaustive list, but hello there. Thank you for joining in. Um, one is that patients move, right? They, they, um, they aren't coming back and so they move. They love you, but they decide that they're gonna go elsewhere. Also, there may be a change in life circumstances or maybe they have some health concerns, right? That might be something that is happening. Also, um, you might become out of network for them. They may be at the same job, but it may have um, a chance where the they change their insurance. So, so now we're out of network and the patient doesn't understand about the value of the treatment. They just want to know, okay, what is my insurance cover? And sometimes that's okay. And sometimes they'll come back, right? We've had those circumstances, they come back. Or they might think that it's too expensive and they want to shop around. And again, they may come back depending upon the experience that they had in your practice. Also, um, speaking of experiences, what if they had a, a bad experience or the first impression wasn't there? That can happen where um, they come to the office and one thing they may do is they may leave a Google review or you send them a survey, they may do that, fill that out and um, give you a response. Or to me, the worst part is if they leave and we never know why, they just don't come back, but we don't, we don't know why. Even a bad review gives us some feedback, right? Not that we like bad reviews, but at least we can go and we can say, hey, let's try to make this right. If we don't know why they left and they just never come back, how are we gonna, how are we gonna try to rectify the situation? Um, sometimes I've heard where, you know, a, a two single people, they get married and then one person goes to a dentist across the way and they encourage their spouse to go. So that might be something. Um, where they say, okay, let's just go together to the same place. So that could be why they leave. Patient doesn't know your menu of services. Oh man, how many times has this happened where patient comes back and now they have Invisalign and you're like, wait a minute, where'd you go do that? Oh, well, we went to the, the guy down the street because they do Invisalign and you do Invisalign and we just never told the patient. Same thing with cosmetic. Oh, we went to a cosmetic dentist and you do veneers and you do cosmetic, um, procedures, but the patient just didn't know that you did procedures like that. They don't see the benefit or the, the ongoing care. They're just, they just don't really see it. You know, they're like, okay, well, I am here today. I may be back in three years, maybe back in two years. 
Um, they're not really sure. They may even have insurance benefits that they don't utilize, but they just don't value the care. Um, and you know, that's our role is to help them to see that, but we can only do so much, right? We need to use our interval photos. We need to understand their values and try to help them. So we always want to remember when we're communicating is to communicate to the patient style of understanding, not our own. And that's, that's a hard thing to try to, to navigate through. But it's a learned behavior. Once you have an awareness, you can say, okay, well, this person likes um, bullet points. This person wants all the research. So there's different ways that we communicate to those different learning styles so that we can help them understand through their perspective. Also, um, maybe the tooth stopped hurting. So they came in for emergency and now the tooth stopped hurting, so they're not going to come back. Um, there could be a transportation or commuting problems. Maybe they take the bus, maybe they, um, their car broke down, maybe they just they can't get there, or um, maybe they're in a wheelchair, or there, there might be accessibility issues that are, that are um, a concern and they just can't get there. Um, the other thing is, is they, maybe they owe you money and they don't want to pay you and so they're not coming back and they kind of hop around. Never a good thing, but it does happen. We don't want that to, to be the case. We always want to make sure that we can give them the, the best insurance estimate in advance so that we can prepare them in, in advance. Not everybody is going to follow suit with that and some are not going to want to pay you regardless. So they may owe you money and they may not want to come back. Let's see, what is next? And make sure you guys please um, answer, ask questions. If you have questions, let me know. Um, what do we look for? Well, um, patients come in and out of our door, so it may feel like we have a nice steady flow of patients. However, we also may feel like we're stuck and not growing. Maybe you're overwhelmed, maybe you have an influx of patients um, and you feel like you're not getting a break. But then all of a sudden you get this thought of, huh, where's that, that Amy? I remember her. She used to come in here. I haven't seen her in a while. And you look back and it's been two years since I've been in or whatever patient you're thinking of. And so whatever happened to that really nice patient in that family, where'd they go? And so we want to make sure that we understand what to look for when we are thinking about patient retention. So some data here. We um, want to run reports to check active patients. Now, if you're not sure, not sure what system you're on, because each software system is a little bit different, but um, EagleSoft, uh, the report for the active patient base is the um, patient analysis report. So that helps us to see um, different demographics, active patients, inactive patients, male, female, age groups. It's a really great report as a summary. Open Dental, there's under the reports, general reports or standard reports, I think it's called, it's um, active patients. And then you look there and it will give you the total number of active patients. And then Dentrix, you can do a patient report and then filters. Now, what's important I think we need to understand first is what do we define as active? You know, what I define as an active patient and what your software defines as an active patient or what you define may be different. So the definition of an active patient, as far as I'm concerned, is one, somebody who has an appointment that has a uh, scheduled appointment in your schedule at the moment and or someone who has been into your office within the last 12 months. So to me, an active patient encompasses that. Some say, some people say 18 months, some say only patients who are scheduled are technically active, but um, I feel like it's a combination between the patients who are in your um, office currently who um, have an appointment and those who you have seen within the last 12 months. Now, your software has a little, most of the time they have like a little box that says active or inactivate. So most of the time it's triggered by that. So it could be five years since that patient's been in, but they're still considered active, even though they haven't been in in five years because that little box is checked in the software. So in order to kind of do chart audits and um, clean up your data so it's a little more accurate, we wanna make sure that 
we are doing quarterly chart audits and we're you know we're making sure and cleaning up those charts and saying okay if a patient hasn't been in what status are they of course we always try to get them back in but we may not be able to reach them they may have um, moved away again part of those reasons why patients leave so we want to make sure that we're doing chart audits and um, you can always reach out to me and i can help you with what that entails a little more but basically um, helping to get our reports more accurate and it gives and it also saves our front office time if you have front office that is calling those unscheduled and it's been five years chances are it's harder to get them back in we really want to focus on the people who are unscheduled that were in the most recently and work backwards okay so then we want to um, check to make sure that we run a report for new patients and a lot of times my offices will say okay yeah i need more, new more more new patients which may be true However, we want to make sure we understand what our flow of new patients is, and not only that, did those new patients schedule their next visit? So you can have a bunch of new patients coming through the door, but if they're not coming back, then we're just having a bunch of patients and no pre-appointment for the next visit. So we want to make sure that we run our reports to say, okay, how many new patients have we seen? compare it to last year, because we also wanna see trends too. I know there's different um, specialties have different months that are more active than others. Of course, a lot of times in dental offices, December, January are really high months for um, procedures, getting, getting things done for the end of the year benefit push, getting those um, insurance benefits utilized to the best of their ability. But also, um, there are certain times of year where ortho and pedo are, are busy as well to make sure in the summertime that the kids get their, get their um, um, treatment done before school starts. So we want to check new patients. We want to check for trends. What are those months where we have higher new patients and then compare month over month from the previous year. So we want to check October of last year to this year and see, okay, what was the difference? Then the next step to that is to say, okay, so yes, we have you know, 50 new patients a month. So what does that look like as far as those patients being scheduled? So you can run that report, look at the patient names, then go in and say, okay, what, what happened with this patient? How did we follow up with that? Because a lot of times our existing patients, we know their names more because we've been seeing them for a while. New patients, we may not remember their name as, as um, you know, likely as we do an existing patient because we're used to, to seeing them every six months. So then we wanna make sure that we are looking at um, who's falling through the cracks with those outstanding balances, unscheduled treatment, overdue treatment. Who's falling through the cracks? What's, what's happening with patients who come in and then they leave without an appointment? Now there's two ways to think about this. There's um, the patients who come in, and I'm gonna talk about this again when we um, touch on it when we talk about pre-appointing, but patients who come in and they have it scheduled, so they leave here with an appointment today, then what happens is they something comes up in their schedule and they call back and say, I can't come in. So then you they get um, put in on, you know, if they don't reschedule, if they don't get another appointment, then they fall into this list. So they may have left your office with an appointment, but then called back and then now they're on this list. Or they could have left your, your um, office without an appointment. So there's two ways that they get on the unscheduled list. Now, our goal is always to have the patient leave with an appointment, right? But there's some professions, you know, if an ER doctor, a fire chief, things like that where patients are on call for their job. And so it's harder for them to, to make those appointments. We certainly can, but then we want to be lenient when they call and say, hey, you know what, I have to go into ER for surgery. You know, we're probably not going to give them the $50 um, fee for late canceling because I know that if I wanted to go to the ER, I want the ER doctor there and not at their dental appointment <laughs> to save 50 bucks. Just a side note there. Okay, and so then we are running our outstanding balances. Oh, and by the way, any of these reports should be a specific system. We wanna make sure that we are doing it consistently and predictably so that we can limit how many 
calls we're making and get a handle on the lists and get the people in. So for example, if we run a report right now on overdue hygiene and it's 300 pages, we want to, and, and that has happened with offices, we want to make sure that we're saying, okay, how can we manage this so that it doesn't get to that point again? Because you may have an active patient base of 2,000 or 2,500 patients, but if they're not actually scheduled, we're not sure where they are, okay? So having a system in place and then having time each and every day to actually have a specific person designated to, to call those patients, text them, email them, use your, use your confirmation systems, your automated systems to do that. However, nothing beats the voice to voice and getting someone and talking to them because we can text all day long, but if we can get them on the phone, then we have a chance to talk to them. Now, getting people to answer the phone or call you back is a little different story. So we live in a technology world, so we've got we've to be able to be flexible and understand how the patient wants to be notified as well. All right, so once you get that system in place, you have blocked time in your schedule for a specific person to work on it. But, um, because like I said, patients leave because they owe money. So we want to try to verify insurance ahead of time. If they have insurance, um, in-house plans are very popular right now, helping patients to be able to afford treatment by having different options. And so if they're not a care credit person, if they're, um, their insurance it, they have um, no insurance and they're paying out of pocket, they call it, then we want to give them options. So helping them understand what their balance is going to be in advance so that they don't have surprises and we don't have surprises and then use our time to track down money, right? We always want to try to collect in advance to the best of our ability. Now, we don't always understand what insurance is going to cover. Um, you know, they say they're going to cover it, and then it comes back that they don't. Mm -hmm. So there are those issues, but we want to try to limit that as much as we can. And then the last thing is um, referrals. Now, what does that have to do with patient retention? Well, we want to make sure that our practice is growing, right? So patient retention, how we get patients is from other patients. We also get it from Google and from our reputation and from different um, um, word of mouth. And we wanna make sure that we are keeping our patients happy so that they tell others because we have those cheerleaders, right? And so I looked up the opposite cheerleader. It's like, okay, so if we have people who are really happy and love us and they're our biggest fan, they're cheerleaders. So they learned a new word and it was called a gloom leader. So the opposite of a cheerleader was a gloom leader. <laughs> So you can have our cheerleaders that say, oh yeah, it's awesome. But then they come in and let's say they, they're, everything's going well and then they have a bad experience. Um, somebody's rude to them or something happens that's out of the ordinary. Then they become our gloom leaders and those will be the people who will now tell the 20 people, okay, don't go there. Where when they have the awesome experience, they're the ones telling the 20 people to go there. So those are the people we want to make our friends. We want to... Um, you know, when they are giving us referrals, we want to definitely say, okay, yes, we, we see you, give them gifts, give them flowers, something, you know, come up with a system that says, you know, when a patient gives us referrals, this is what we're going to do. Now, there are laws against like bribing our patients and saying, okay, you know, if you do this, then you get that. That's not, that's not what I'm talking about. I'm talking about just saying, you know, we appreciate you and we are not bribing you. We're saying, you know, thank you so much for referring those patients. Does that make sense? All right. Okay. So then what's next? Let's see. We want to go for systems. So I mentioned the word systems a couple of times. Systems are our friend. Now I know a lot of times people think, okay, systems, it sort of means work. It actually is the opposite of that. When you put, when you have systems in place, you're trained appropriately on those systems and you're able to have an efficient workspace and be able to follow a process so you get predictable results. So that's really what, what is the purpose of a system. A lot of times, if there aren't systems in place, it's just kind of organized chaos a little bit. But once you have those systems in place, which it can be work to get that system in place, once it's there, it's, it's like, you know, a, 
a wheel turning in a in a awesome direction, right? And it's nice and oiled and we want to make sure that's the way we're running. So systems for um, patient retention, pre-appointing. So what does that mean? That means when the patient leaves that they have their next reserved appointment. So using those terms like reserved appointment instead of scheduled, you know, and I sort of say it interchangeably, but when I'm talking to patients saying, okay, let's go ahead and get you scheduled, get you um, a reserved time in the appointment for your next hygiene visit. So instead of cleaning your hygiene visit, let's reserve time. Oh, today you're in at 10 o'clock. Great, let's get you in 10 o'clock on a Tuesday. Let's reserve time for you in six months, 10 o'clock on a Tuesday. And that way you've just eliminated all, oh, do you like morning or evening? Do you like, you know, um, beginning of the week, end of the week? So you just, they're in there at that time. Let's get them scheduled at the same time, reserve it. And um, then they're good to go. And, you know, whether the hygiene, hygienist schedules the next hygiene visit or their front office, it really depends on the office. I mean, for me, when I worked clinical hygiene, I liked doing it because then I had more control over my schedule. Um, I think it's efficient in the back to do it, but it doesn't always work for every office that way. Case acceptance followed up. Um, this is a tough one to really document in your um, computer software unless you're utilizing your software efficiently. I find this report to be probably one of the most inaccurate um, because if we're not using, like for instance, EagleSoft has an accept in the treatment plan section, it has you know, proposed, completed, accepted, rejected, um, referral in the treatment plan. So there's a little drop down menu. So if you're not actually using those little dot, you know, those drop downs, they're not going into the accurate report. So if you could type in proposed, everything looks proposed, nothing's completed, nothing's accepted, everything's gonna look like it's proposed treatment. So um, then you run a report on you know, proposed treatment, which would be sort of your treatment pending, your unscheduled, and even people that have it accepted it's proposed. So understanding how your software works and the little nuances that can bring your treatment plan and case acceptance number more accurate, you can always call your software company and have them do some training on that but most of them have little nuances that, that really do help with that. But basically, what, there's two ways to look at case acceptance. And one is today, like who left with an appointment today and who left without an appointment. So let's say we had five patients in that all needed treatment and we documented, and, and you know, you can always put this in a spreadsheet if you have an analytic system like Dental Intel or Practice by Numbers, you can use those as well, those are awesome. Um, you can use an Excel sheet, um, Google document, whatever, to, to track it. But basically, five patients um, ha today have, have treatment that they need. Let's look at, okay, how many of those actually scheduled, okay? Because that's what's considered accepted. If we proposed it today, if we said, okay, here's, here's the plan, we presented it, and they don't accept it, then we would put them on a sheet, and then we would say, okay, let's give you a call back in a week. They need to check their spouse, they need to check their schedule, whatever, whatever that may be. Um, and then we check back with them and we have a system for that. So that's one thing. So that's like same day case acceptance and then we can follow up. Um, then it's really goes into the sort of the unscheduled or the people who come in for their hygiene visit and then we can follow up with them. Say, oh, okay, during the morning meeting, you can say, all right, well, yesterday we had five people who, um, who proposed treatment and three of them accepted, I'm gonna follow up with them. And then you can kind of make sure that the dentist knows and the team knows, okay, these people were in, I'm gonna follow up with them. Because a lot of times in the back office, the, the team doesn't know, they, they've just done this beautiful presentation and then the patient is, comes up front and says, okay, no, I don't wanna schedule. So we wanna make sure that we're in this, the team effort to understand why the patient didn't, didn't schedule. And then, um, also looking at the morning meeting, okay, what hygiene patients are in that didn't schedule um, for treatment? And same thing on the doctor side. The doctor could say, oh, who has a hygiene visit? So it all comes to getting them back on the schedule to do with patient retention. Because if they're not on the schedule, we don't really have control of what, um, where they're going, right? What they're doing for their dental care. All right, 
unscheduled treatment and hygiene, same kind of thing as I mentioned earlier, blocking that time, making sure you have a system. So not only understanding and bringing an awareness to the report, but saying, what is that system? And understanding that we need to have a process and not just, oh, we do it when we can. Because I hear that a lot is, oh yeah, well, we try. Okay, well, we either, trying is either you do it or you don't do it. Trying is just sort of like, okay, well, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to try to floss. Okay, well, I'm either going to floss or I'm not, right? <laughs> and go get the floss picks, whatever. But, um, but I get what they're trying to say is, is my, my schedule's busy and when I get a free moment. Well, let's get it on the schedule and say, okay, you know, Susie from one to two, that's going to be your time to do that. And that's what Susie does from that time. And then training her on the system and what to say, because we have to have that intentional communication so that we're all on the same page as to what it is we're saying for those patients. All right, new patient experience. What does that look like for your office? You know, getting a system, and it kind of it sounds kind of weird, like what's a system for a new patient experience? Well, it's okay, how do we answer the phone? What do we say? Do we have a new patient call slip? What is the new patient on, you know, how do we, what's that intake form look like? What does it sound like? Um, when the patient comes in, who greets them first? Do we give them an office tour? Um, do they get a new patient packet? Do they get a new patient gift? So what's that experience that they're having when they come here? So again, putting that into a system. So if I come to your office as a new patient and then my spouse comes to the office as a new patient, we both have a similar experience. We could say, oh, they're awesome. They took great care of us. Emergency patients, understanding that, you know, that's a really great way to have retention. Let's say it's a new patient, emergency patient. They're coming in for a toothache. We're not going to be, we're going to treat them differently than the new patient experience who's coming to be an established patient, right? So we want to make sure that we have a system for how emergency patients come in. And if they don't schedule for a comprehensive exam, what's our follow-up with that? Because that's a lot of times where, where um, patients can get lost is that emergency visit. Unpaid balances, making sure, again, we have a system for what that looks like. So the patient is aware that, you know, this is an estimate, there may be a balance, expect a bill in the mail, or, um, you know, we have a patient portal, you can pay online. So giving them lots of options. You know, one of my previous episodes, I talked about setting expectations and that's really what that's about is, you know, patients don't ever want to, I mean, I don't say ever, but most people do not like having to pay money for things that they don't feel like they should, right? Mm -hmm. And many people say, okay, I only want to do what my insurance covers, right? Have we heard that before? just once, right? <laughs> Many times, all the time. So it's kind of like a mantra in the dental office. So we want to make sure that they understand that, you know, there could be a balance and, and not only just saying the words, but helping them with that active listening and, and, you know, helping them to, to say it back to you in a way that they understand that it's, it's not just words coming out of your mouth that they actually know what that means. Because guess what? You know, we deal with this stuff all day long. They don't, you know, they're not, I mean, even my own dental insurance changed recently and I'm like, what in the world? Why am I having to pay for x-rays now? I never had to before, but now insurance companies are getting smart and they're saying, oh, okay, well, she has a healthy mouth, so she doesn't have to, um, she never pays her deductible, the $50. So now they're taking it off the x-rays and now have to pay for x-rays. I didn't know that. So I, you know, I wasn't upset with with them for charging me, I just didn't understand. And so, and I'm someone who knows about dental stuff and I value it. So people who don't, I mean, they get angry because they don't understand. So we wanna help them set that expectation that you may have a balance and, and this is why. Service recovery. Basically what that means is like, if we do something that the patient perceives as a bad experience, a bad impression, um, something that we were rude, um, whatever that perception is. And I say it's a perception because, you know, perception is reality, whether, you know, we're the most fantastic office in the world, people's perception is, could be different. So whatever that is. So service recovery is saying, okay, now that we know, and again, this is of the patients that we know had a, had, didn't have a great experience. Now what do we do about it? 
So what's that system behind, if we have a patient, like for instance, if you have a um, patient who comes in and you're running behind, maybe it's after 20 minutes, you say to them, oh, you know what, we are apologize for um, making you wait. Here's a, you know, $10 gift card to Starbucks. We just want to say thank you for being an awesome patient. So doing something like that, you know, maybe that's a system is that after a certain amount of time when the patient's waiting for us, we, we give them a gift card or something like that. Um, another service recovery could be that you're calling them, having the doctor call, have the hygienist call, whoever, you know, is closest to that patient and just listen to them. Because, you know, we all have a story. Patients come in, sometimes they come in angry, sometimes they come in you know, completely happy, but yet they're dying on the inside because they have stuff going on, but yet they're smiling on the outside. So we don't know what their story is and we don't want to make assumptions on, on what that is. So we, we want to try to make it right for them. So having a system on, on when things go wrong, how do we fix it? And then confirmation, the systems for confirmation for patient retention. Patient retention, again, is keeping the patients in the door, keeping them happy, and returning and, and referring their friends. So our practice grows. So having that confirmation system, knowing the automation, again, this is setting expectations. Having so many people tell me, oh, my patients get so upset because they get all these reminders. Well, let them know. You know, just let them know. I mean, like, people are usually pretty tolerant if you just say, hey, you know what? I know you're going to get a series of, of um X-ray, or uh, X-rays, yeah, series of X-rays, maybe that too. But you're going to get a series of text messages, emails, some calls. You know, just so you know, this is our system. We, um, once you hit confirm, don't worry if you get another one, it's okay. And just let them know, like, just to expect if you get these things. However, if you don't hit confirm, you're going to keep getting them, depending upon what service you go through. You know, you hit confirm and you don't get another one until an hour before. Some keep going. So just let them know and just say, you know, it's, it's the, the way the system works and, and we really value you as a patient. You know, we don't want you to get annoyed by this. Just, just be aware that this is going to be happening. They'll say, okay. Oops, add one more. And then referrals and marketing. Now how we build our patient base is by referrals, um, marketing, and understanding what is our reputation? What are we putting out there? So if we, want, if we want patients to stay, what is our message that we're sending out? What's our brand? So we have to be clear on who we are as a practice in order for patients to come to our office to begin with and then to actually stay. So not only are we should we be focused on the new patient experience, but the existing or established patient experience. So once you're in the office, okay, you can spend all this money on marketing and all this, but if you come in and then we fall short later on, then we know that, okay, what happened here? Let's take a look at what we do for our established patients and our new patients and how can we bridge that gap or if there is a gap. So the cost, the, the title of the series is cost of communication, right? Because as we've been learning the, communication, how we communicate with our patients can cost us. And so if we're not communicating with our patients, it can cost. And sometimes when we are communicating, but they're perceiving it as what we're not saying. So like we might say something and it's what we don't say that's the problem, not what we do say, if that makes sense. So for example, the setting the expectations, oh, talking about confirmation, but if we don't go that extra step and say, here's what to expect with a confirmation system, then they might get annoyed with it, right? So it's also what we do say and what we don't say. It's also our body language. And we learned that you know, communication comes through emojis, it comes through your body language, it comes through text messages, emails, looking at every single part of your practice, your brand and saying, okay, we send text messages out, but what do they actually say? Send it to yourself and say, okay, is this, if I got this in my own text from another office, what would I think about it, right? Or have you checked out your website lately? What does your website look like? I had a client one time who, I went to her website. I'm like, do you realize like your website's not even working right now? <laughs> She's like, what do you mean? And so it, there, was, there was something wrong with it and nobody knew because people weren't going on it and checking it out. So we want to make sure that we're 
having someone in the office that's periodically checking those things. Because if you're, if you're, if, if I'm a new patient, I'm calling your office and your front office team is going through the system the intake form, they should be saying, hey, check out our website, see what our menu of services are. And I go to your website and then, oh, and this happened the other day too. I was um, at an office and their website took me to Canada and I'm in Arizona. I'm like, I don't think so. <laughs> I, think, I think that's a little too far. It's too long of a commute. So it, there, something had happened. And so just making sure those little things are there because we want convenience for our patients. We don't want them to have to think, okay, um, why, why is this website the wrong, um, taking me to the wrong spot? So cost, time, money, our reputation, physical and mental health, and it costs the growth of the practice. So how we communicate or how we don't communicate costs all those things. And we want to make sure that we retain our patients, and then we also grow our practice with those patients referring other patients. So what is my challenge to you? My challenge to you is to learn, learn your software to the point of understanding those reports. So just one step at a time, one intentional step saying, okay, what, what is my new patient um, report look like compared to last year? Are there any trends? Are there certain months where I have more new patients than others? And why is that? I wonder why is it because it's June's really low because everyone's on vacation. I don't know. Maybe um, that could be. Uh, running the, understanding the case acceptance and saying, what is my percentage? And really looking at that, because I tell you what, once you get awareness as to what is going on, that's when you can say, okay, let's take that 52% case acceptance and make it 53% and then see what that dollar value is. And these are patients already in your practice. They're just on the unscheduled list. So let's get, reactivate them, get them back in because they're your patients. They love you. Let's help them to, to understand the value of treatment, not by lecturing them, not by, you know, educating them more. Because to be honest, education in the dental office, if, if it was only about how much we educate our patients, everyone would be flossing, everyone would be not eating sugar, you know, if it's only about educating people. Because we know, we live in the age of technology and knowing, it's a matter of making the connection to our own selves to each individual person and helping them to on that journey so um that's where i am going to end it today does anybody have any questions let me see i got something in the chat box here let's see you mentioned referrals. What about patients referred from insurance? Should we recognize that as well? Or is it more of a, if a patient prefers more patients to you? Uh, absolutely, definitely, definitely. If they're referred from insurance, anywhere that referral is from, if they are referred from another patient, if they're referred from, well, Google can't really do too much. Google's like owns it all, right? <laughs> but um, yes, also, um, if that person comes in and they have insurance, and it's pretty decent insurance, even if it's crappy insurance, let them know, hey, you know what? You found us on your insurance website. Do you have any coworkers looking? You know, if you've got one from that company, get everybody, you know? Ha Maybe that's the person you send the flowers to that now all of a sudden everybody in the office sees, oh, who'd you get the flowers from? Oh, my dental office for being a new patient. So something so that you can, it, you know, wherever that referral comes from, make it count. Um, another one with insurance is, you know, reaching out, like for instance, there was, I was in an office on Monday and they had a patient in that covered a hundred percent preventative, 80% crowns. I mean, it was a hundred percent night guards. I mean, who covers night guards? What insurance company covers night guards? They did. So I said to them, okay, you need to market to that HR department at that company to make sure that you're getting those people there and saying, Hey, you know what? your insurance covers this much, so let's get you going. So absolutely, reach out to insurance, any, any patient that comes to your office, if you can get more patients like them that come from there, then reach out to them for sure. Great question. Yes, 
You are welcome. Thank you for the question. Yes. And, you know, and that's what I'm saying. Like, at, do you have any coworkers? Do you have, you can even send in like a little, um, to the HR department or the person who does the, um, um, what do I say, like the intake of the insurance. Sometimes it's an HR person. Sometimes it's, I can't, I, the word's escaping me right now of who that would be, but a person that deals with that in the office and send them a little, a little thank you and say, Hey, you know what, we're in network. Um, and you know, we, we pre appreciate you and your hard work in your HR department. So anybody, you know, people want to feel appreciated. And if some random person can help you, and again, this, and, and I say random, but intentional is a better word. You know, people do random acts of kindness. I mean, I really feel like it should be intentional acts of kindness. If I'm intentional about, you know what, I want to be kind to this many people, then it's not just, oh, when I feel like it, like, you know what, this is what's happening. So, so yeah, so marketing, I love the whole marketing thing. There's so much to talk about with that. Um, so awesome. Great, great. All right. If no more questions, then you can always reach me. You have my contact information here, amy at bridgethegapcs.com. You can text me. You can call me. I'm here to help. I'm in Arizona time zone right now. I live in Arizona, but sometimes I'm in other areas, but feel free because I am here to help you and help you grow your practice and answer any questions you have. So thank you so much for joining me for the cost of communication, patient retention. Have a great night. Thank you.